to put the gospel of St. Mark into context so you understand better the lessons that the Holy Spirit wants to teach you, we have to understand that Jesus is now on his way to Jerusalem. There he will enter the city eventually on Palm Sunday where they want to make him king. We will then journey with him through Holy Week and then you come to Holy Thursday evening where he institutes the gift of the Most Holy Eucharist so that he will be with us until the end of time for the Eucharist is really, truly, and substantially Jesus' body, blood, soul, and divinity. His body is true food and his blood is true drink. And we're privileged to enter into that gift every holy sacrifice of the Mass if we're in a state of grace. Jesus goes from the Last Supper to the Garden of Gethsemane and sweats blood, praying for all the sins of mankind to be forgiven for mankind to accept his sacrifice. He's betrayed, arrested, accused, unjustly judged. And then he's scourged, crowned with thorns, convicted, carries his cross, and eventually suffers and dies on the cross with Mary at the foot of the cross, uniting her suffering with his suffering And Jesus does this because he loves us. When you love somebody, you're willing to suffer for them. Even die for them. And Jesus died for us. He was buried, but then on Easter Sunday, he rises to give us a new life. But the most important thing, what he does in this whole fulfillment of his mission, from coming into heaven, coming into the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, From the time he entered into our humanity, all he ever thought about was fulfilling this mission to glorify the Father and to bring salvation to those who will accept the gift. And then he finishes his mission when he ascends into heaven, and then he's going to prepare a place for us, and he sends the Holy Spirit after establishing the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We know this, but the disciples the apostles that are journeying with him towards the fulfillment of this mission, they don't understand this yet. But Jesus is trying to share the depths of his heart with them. Jesus wants to share the depths of his heart with us. That's why when you enter the word of God, it needs to be a heart-to-heart relationship. This isn't just the remembrance of a historical reality, while it is a historical reality, this is a living word, a living teaching. So, the Gospel of St. Mark. In chapter 8, 9, and 10, easy to remember, 8, 9, and 10, all around verse 30 it starts, give or take, in chapter 8, 9, and 10 of the Gospel of St. Mark, Jesus Jesus is telling his disciples, his apostles, his closest friends that he's going to go to Jerusalem and suffer and die. But he's going to rise. And they don't understand. So they get distracted. Because in the first prediction, which we heard last week in chapter 8, once the disciples, the apostles heard of suffering, human nature, we we all want to get away from suffering. But there's a difference between just suffering and redemptive suffering, suffering for love. Love can transform suffering into a power that can help redeem and heal. Jesus shows us that by the power of God, the the love of God. So in the the first teaching, chapter 8, After Peter makes a great confession revealed to him by God the Father that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and Jesus says, on this rock I will build my church. Wow. Peter, though, then takes Jesus aside after he 
starts talking about suffering, when Jesus starts talking about suffering and Jesus rebukes him. And remember what Jesus said, you're thinking as humans do. He even said, get thee behind me, Satan. You're thinking as humans do, not as God does. Let's think the way God does. And then Jesus gave us that teaching. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. That's the main lesson from the first teaching of Jesus on his way to fulfill his mission of love, his suffering and his love, glorifying the Father and saving mankind for those who will accept it. I want to make sure that you get this. So there's the teaching about Jesus' mission and the fulfillment of this mission. The disciples don't understand. We may not understand at times. And then there's a lesson. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. Now, today, we're in chapter 9. And Jesus, again, predicts his passion, what I shared with you. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He's now in the area of Galilee. He's going to go up to Jerusalem, up to the temple, up to Calvary on the cross, lifting mankind up to the Trinity for those who accept the gift. And what happens? The disciples didn't understand what he was talking about. It says it right here in the gospel. They didn't understand, and they were afraid to ask him. Never be afraid to ask Jesus, what do you mean? Now, he'll reveal in time, as he wills, what you need to know. But ask him in prayer, what do you mean? Don't ever be afraid. And instead, what happens today? The disciples were arguing about who's the greatest. Sometimes we get distracted. Instead of really staying focused on our mission, we get distracted in, in things that are really meaningless. Vanity. Centering on our pride. Who's the greatest? Jesus. That's it. And, and, and we all have to remember our simple call, just like the disciples, the apostles. Many were fishermen. They were simple men. It's a privilege to be called by Jesus. And so Jesus, again, has a lesson. They didn't understand. They were afraid to ask him, what's the lesson today? Well, there's two lessons. If anyone wants to be first, he shall be the last of all and the servant of all. If anybody wants to be first, he shall be the last of all and the servant of all. And then, a very important lesson that I'm going to focus on for you, we must become as a child to enter the kingdom of God. We must be childlike, not childish. Childlike, not childish. We'll get to that. The beauty of how children, when they're behaving well, are, 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 are beloved by God. And Jesus himself even identifies with the child by putting his arms around the child and says, whoever receives one child such as this in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but the one who sent me. We want to receive the Father. We want to receive the Holy Spirit. We actually want to have a deep relationship with the Word of God, the eternal Son of God, the light of the world. So we'll get to this lesson, but I'll go to the third prediction of the Passion, chapter 10, where, again, Jesus is talking about fulfilling his mission, and what happens then? St. John and St. James, I love them both. My middle name's John, my confirmation name is James, but I can relate. They, they have their mother go ask Jesus that one can sit on Jesus' right and one can sit on his left when he comes into the kingdom. Again, they're not understanding what the true kingdom is about. It's not about competition and, and having power and honor and wealth or, and money. There's going to be no money in heaven. Or pleasure. We're going to have, we're going to have so much pleasure in heaven, but it's not about fleshly pleasure in this world, okay? But that's what we tend to get attracted to. Those are the things that seems like we understand. And then we get in a competition. Who's higher than the other? Jesus said, whoever's last 
will be first. And so the lesson then in chapter 10, Jesus says first that to be first, you must basically be last. Reiterating what he taught today, but he said it in a more radical way. He said, you must become the servant of all, even the slave of all. Take the lowest position, that of a slave, for the Son of Man came to serve, not to be served, okay? So the three lessons are deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me, right? If you wish to be first, you need to be the last of all, the servant of all, and become as a child. And then you need to become a servant, a slave, and become a, like Jesus, who came to serve, not to be served. So let's be good disciples. Okay, let's focus on becoming children of God. That's what happens in baptism. When you're baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit by water in a Trinitarian formula, you become a child of God at that moment by supernatural grace. Before that, you're, you're created in the image and likeness of God. Every human's created in the image and likeness of God, but they have just a natural life. But after baptism, they begin their supernatural life. They have to still grow and develop. But to be a true child of God is so important. What I want to share with you are some aspects of what it's like to be a spiritual child, to be childlike, to please God, not childish, childlike. And all of us want this. You can also reflect what happens when we grow up. Why do we lose sight of this? Okay, so I'm going to go into 11 or 12 aspects of being childlike. One, children are filled with awe and wonder. Let's keep that, brothers and sisters. That's going to attract people to the church. That's going to attract people to, to Jesus. That's going to make your life rich and wonderful. Awe and wonder. Just like when you look at fireworks, or you look at the sea, or you look at a flower, or you look at a bird. You look at beautiful things. You're filled with awe and wonder. Never lose that. Amazing. Look at how even like animals walk and move. Isn't it amazing that God made animals to be able to walk and move and how they do di things in different ways? You ever look at a dog? It looks like they're smiling. I mean, it's amazing how he ma made them with that, you know, that smile. Cats sort of have their smile in a different way. But that's not, that's not my point of the homily. It's like to be filled with awe and wonder and everything. Do you want that? The whole world wants it. If we have it, people will come to Jesus. Second, children have the capacity to believe and to have faith. They trust their mother and their father. Fathers are taught when they have little children, they should do what's called um, uh, an act of, of building up trust in the child, gently, you know, holding the child, but every so often, you know, like, like tossing him up, not too high, but tossing him up and catching him, teaching him trust, putting a child up on the shoulders of a father. I was speaking to my own natural mother about this the other day. My grandfather, Joseph, was six foot five, very tall. And my mom, when she was a, a little girl, I mean, when she was in her daddy's arms, she felt so secure. My, my daddy's a giant. You know, my daddy will protect me. That's a child. Hi, mom. She'll be watching this. To believe and to have faith, to trust your mother. When you call mom, you know mom's going to come running, right? You know mom's there for you. Children can believe and have faith. That's what we need to do. Have, believe and have faith in God. He loves us so much. He died for us, but he rose for us, and he ascended to heaven, and he's got, he's got the whole world in his hand. I could start singing a, a child song, right? Even if things are looking dark in this world, no one can take things out of his hand. He's God. So believe and have faith. The third aspect of a child that relates to it, total trust. Total trust in God. Total trust that, that, that things are going to work out. Children, 
you know, they don't hold on to things. Every so often they throw little temper tantrums, but you know, it's amazing how, how they get back to just being absorbed in things, and I'm going to get to that, but being present in the moment, trusting. Fourth, again, to be childlike, total dependence. A child knows that it can't f- find food for itself, that it can't go earn money. I should say he or she can't, can't go get a job to buy a house and clothe themselves. They have dependence on their parents. That's how God created things. God could have made us all grown-ups when we came into the world. God could have done it, right? Thank God he didn't. <laughs> we need to be childlike, but not childish, not those temper tantrums. Total dependence on God. Fifth, humble. Children are little. Humility is truth. We're all little. Let's not get in that competition of who's the greatest, who deserves the most honor, who who has the power. God has the power. God has the honor. God is the greatest. Be humble. And love everybody and see the goodness of God. Six, be free. Children are free. It's amazing how free children are. They, they just run around, you know, and, and when they meet, meet other children, they meet and they just kind of get along when they're, you know, it's just beautiful. They're free. God wants us to be free in his love. He's got his eye on us, but he wants us to be free. Not free to do things that hurt ourselves or hurt other people, but to be free. I remember being down the, the beach further north of here, and there's a place where just uh, people dr- drove up with their golf carts, and the children got out of, out of the golf cart, and boy, they were running so fast and jumping over little ravines and landing in the sand, and, and then other children get there, and they were doing all these things. Part of me was thinking, I wish I had that energy, <laughs> but, <laughs> but children are free. Seventh, children are filled with joy. Joy. God wants us to be joyful in his love. Yeah, there's difficult things we have to deal with, but in the end, God's our father, and Mary, if you've asked her, she's your spiritual mother. Jesus gave us to her as a mother from the cross. He said, behold your mother. Take her as your spiritual mother. Be filled with joy. And the order of joy, J is Jesus, O is others, why, I, I don't know how I can make a why, but why is you? That's the order of joy. Jesus first, others second, you third. Eighth, children live in the present. They're present to the present. In fact, children love presents. Everybody actually loves presents, but children really love presents. And when they, they tear into a present and they get a present, they're just, this is all that matters. That's all that matters right then, right? They open the present. That's all that matters. I, look at this. And then they start showing everybody. And then, then they open it up and they want to play the game or, or with a toy with the other children, right? They're present to the moment. We need to practice the presence of God. I hope you want these things in your life. That's why I'm sharing them with you. I don't know how it is when we, quote unquote, grow up, we lose sight of this. To be present. And and so you receive presence and you give presence. That's what Jesus is talking about. I'm giving you my life so you can give my life to other people and bring all kinds of blessings to their lives. Live in the present moment. Ninth, children dream and have imaginations about wonderful things. All the possibilities are open to them. With God, everything's possible. Why is it when we grow up, it's like, oh, I, I don't know if I'm going to make it through the day. Oh, it's raining today. Oh, uh, I, I, I don't know. All I have is... Uh, um, this same old job that I have to go to, I hope I make it through the day. Come on. Dream. God wants better things for you than you want for yourself. Seek that out. Find it in prayer. Children, 10, forgive easily. They really do. They, maybe not 
okay, maybe not immediately sometimes, you know, they might powder or whatever, but that's not really being childlike, that's being childish. But next thing you know, one hour later, they're laughing and they're playing with the same kid, right? Forgive easily. Eleven, children seek God's blessing. God just wants to bless. Our, think about your life. Your whole life is a blessing. How many blessings have you been filled with already today? this last week, this last month, your whole life. Count your blessings. And then 12, I'll just put it kind of in a one word, simple. Just be simple. Just be simple. Why do we complicate everything? Why do we make everything so complicated? God is God, we're not. Pretty simple, right? God is God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Twelve articles of faith, pretty simple. God is God, we're not. Let's be childlike, not childish. Yes, we're called to be servants. We're created to know, love, and serve God and be happy with Him forever in heaven. But in the end, keep it simple. Be like the Blessed Virgin Mary. Just say yes to whatever God asks. Yes, the more you love, the more you'll suffer. But the more you suffer because of love, the more filled with God you will be. Become saints. Amen.